in front of 49 returning Hall of Famers and an estimated crowd of 45,000 fans in Cooperstown. The Major League Baseball Hall of Fame inducted its largest class of players since 1955 this past July. Four players went into the hall as the class of 2015 and as is customary, they gave speeches mingled with the other members of the sport's most exclusive fraternity. The crowd gathered in Cooperstown to watch was estimated to be the fourth largest in the history of the induction ceremony. And the man who in many ways is responsible for the experience of the tens of thousands of fans, for the players, for the Hall of Famers, is Brad Horn, who is the Vice President of Communication and Education at the Hall of Fame. Thanks for being here, Brad. Thank you, Kelly. Pleasure to be with you this evening. It was another successful Hall of Fame weekend. When does your preparation for that begin? Pretty much the day after Hall of Fame weekend comes to a close. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, July 26th, uh, the Hall of Fame ceremonies, 45,000 fans celebrating four new inductees, Pedro Martinez, Craig Biggio, Randy Johnson. Um, it was just a, an ama amazing class, uh, left yep. out John Smoltz there, yeah. uh, of new inductees. And, and what the Hall of Fame weekend represents is the culmination of a, a life in baseball. It's the celebration of all the achievements at Little League, Major League, and, and being the crowning achievement in a player's career, not only for the player, but for the tens of thousands of fans that come, for the members of the media, for the baseball community, which descends almost in mass on our little village, 75 <laughs> miles to the west of, of the capital here, uh, to celebrate baseball and, and all that's great about the game. And, and I know that the crowd in many ways is going to be, the size of the crowd will be dictated by who's being inducted. But with that being said, when you look at this summer, when you look at last summer, and the fact that you're putting up you know, crowds that are right there as far as the top 10 of all time, it's gonna make you feel pretty good. Well, it's amazing. We've had 10 new inductees over the last two years. Mm -hmm. Last year in 2014, six inductees, which included the three managers, Joe Torre, yep. Bobby Cox, uh, along with the three players, uh, plus the four this year. You've got an infusion of, of youth coming into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and in two year span, over 100,000 visitors wow. partaking in induction weekend. It's great wow. for Central New York. It's great for the business of baseball preservation. Yep. And for us with the Baseball Hall of Fame, now in our 76th year, it's providing us new opportunities to connect with fans all across the globe and create return visitation, return interest in Cooperstown. And that's what re really generates who we are and what we do. It's your job. It has been for a very long time. But were you a, a, a huge baseball fan growing up? Do you still get to kind of feel like a kid sometimes doing this job? Absolutely. I, I force myself over Hall of Fame weekend or really any day of the year mm -hmm. to take a step back every once in a while and remember this is a game that millions of fans love. This is a game I loved as a kid growing up in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. This is a iconic, beautiful pastoral setting in the middle of one of arguably the most beautiful regions anywhere in the country. And fans mm -hmm. descend all year long, more than 16 million fans since we opened our doors for the first time in 1939, to relive their baseball moments. They come into the plaque gallery to celebrate their heroes. They come mm -hmm. to the museum to look at artifacts from special moments. They come to see baseball's past, but what they rediscover is really their own. And they leave with an emotional experience that lasts a lifetime. So to be a keeper of that, to be in charge of helping facilitate that creation, it's just an absolutely magnificent dream every day uh, to do the things that we get to do in this unique institution. One of my favorite moments going to the Hall of Fame is I've had a, the opportunity over the past several years to be there when a future Hall of Famer who is yet to be inducted, but they're taking their backstage kind of tour of the Hall of Fame. And it's remarkable to see how excited they get. You know, they're going to have their own plaque. It's something maybe they've been dreaming about since they were a little kid. Do you have those moments where you get to kind of see that in them? Those are some of the best days of the entire year, Kelly. Yeah. And it's primarily because baseball players are just like you and I. They mm -hmm. have their heroes, their own moments. Mm -hmm. And even though they achieve the highest level of baseball, the top 1%, they're in this moment of excellence. And it's usually not until they take that trip through the archive of the museum, yeah. through the gallery when no one else is around, do they begin to realize they're a part of that sure. club. Right. And to see that realization creates chills, it creates some magical memories, and uh, it's, a, it's really great to be there to see it happen for the first time. You have a new exhibit that will be opening soon. 
We do. It's called Whole New Ball Game, mm -hmm. and it takes a look at this period that all of us have lived through as baseball fans, or all of us know who are baseball fans today, the 1970s forward. We've seen magnificent and remarkable growth in the game, television ratings, revenue associated with the game, mm -hmm. record number of attendance, uh, television contracts, players. We've also seen some bad sides. We've seen some performance-enhancing drug issues. We've seen contract issues, but we've seen great labor peace over the last mm -hmm. 20 years. All of these are going to go into a storyline based exhibit called Whole New Ball Game that really explores how baseball in the 1970s changed as we know it and how in 2015 what we have at the game today we owe to the changes that took place in the 1970s, in the 1980s. And it's a permanent addition to the museum. It's going to recraft the end of our timeline exhibit on the second floor mm -hmm. and, and give fans a, a great opportunity to celebrate. Boston Red Sox fans, they're going to mm -hmm. see those that long 86-year streak broken not once, not twice, but three times yep. in recent years. Chicago White Sox fans, an 88-year streak broken. So many important milestones and then moments that have helped shape the fabric of of the American culture and society over the last 40 years will all be featured in that exhibit. One of my favorite exhibits really came from a generation before the 70s with the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League and there was actually a local Craryville resident who played in that league. I was able to tell her story a few years ago. Let's take a look. Baseball's all-time greats mingle in the halls of Cooperstown. Ruth, Cobb, Williams. But if you know where to look, Mixed in among the names and faces of baseball's immortals, you'll find a dairy farmer from Craryville, New York. It's something I'll never forget, being playing professional uh, baseball with these girls. They were, they were really, really great. In 1949, Lillian Shattuck, now Campbell, played one season in the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Are you crying? No. In 1992, Hollywood and Tom Hanks made the league famous. There's no crying in baseball! 38 years after the Rockford Peaches played their final game. Campbell played outfield for the Sallies. And this is the Springfield Sallies. These are the, the two teams that traveled into 26 different states. But before the summer of 49, she'd barely left her family's farmhouse outside of Hudson. We lived right over there, in that house over there. Still standing, just a long home run away from where the almost 82-year-old lives today. Back then, Pete, a nickname she picked up as a kid, was the only girl on her high school baseball team. When she was 20, her dad handed her a newspaper ad for a women's baseball tryout in Newark. We had a tryout, you know, throwing the ball and being working on a dairy farm, lifting the milk cans and doing things. I had a strong arm and I could throw the ball from a center field, right field, left field on one bounce to home plate. When her arm earned her a roster spot, Campbell caught a train to Chicago and left everything she knew behind. I hated to leave my mother and father because I knew they needed my help on the farm too. But yeah, I really wanted to play ball. The rules were strict. There was no drinking, no smoking, and uh, no, uh, no boys. But the money was good, 100 bucks a week. And I knew my mother and father could use the money, so I sent $75 home. And if there was one drawback, it was the dress code. I'll tell you one thing, with wearing those skirts and those bloomers, you didn't slide too often. You didn't slide too often because you'd get a strawberry, <laughs> Vaseline or something you put on that, and oh God, it smelled terrible. <laughs> All the way down to the strawberries, Campbell praises the movie for its accuracy, with one exception. Very true, except for Tom Hanks. I haven't got ball players, I've got girls. <laughs> that was not true, Tom Hanks. But one role does hit pretty close to home. Hi, my name's May, and that's more than a name, that's an attitude. And she says, Grammy, she says, I know, she says, you're Madonna. <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> After the Sally's final game of the season, her boyfriend, who missed most of the year serving in the Marines, picked her up. On the way home, he proposed to me, so that was the end of my baseball season, and then uh, we got married in, in January of 1950. Back to life as a farmer, and then kids, grandkids, and now great-grandkids, with only one regret. I wish I had gone to play another year, really, but you know how one thing leads to another. She'll never get one more year. But how about one more throw? As the Mets return to City Field to start a six-game homestand. On Mother's Day, Campbell's been invited by the Mets to throw out the game's first pitch. I've been practicing, and I think I, I can think I can do it. I have a little arthritis in his hand. I'm pretty sure that I could still throw the ball out. I'm hoping for a strike. 
In October, she'll fly to San Diego for a reunion with the girls she shares a wall with in Cooperstown. And though Campbell doesn't have her own plaque at the Hall of Fame, she does at the Takata Kill Softball Diamond, where she bought and donated a $5,000 scoreboard. Did you ever think that, you know, 60 years later, that it would still mean this much to you and to your loved ones and to the whole community? No, I didn't really think it uh, would, but now, when everything's happened to me lately, I said, uh, it really, I'm so proud of this, really. And I'm so grateful that the good Lord gave me a chance to be here and do this. Like the living legends she rooms with in Cooperstown, Campbell still gets letters every week asking for autographs, and she signs each one. Still to this day, an all-American girl and the most famous dairy farmer in upstate. And that exhibit in Cooperstown at the Hall of Fame that has Pete's name on it has been open, believe it or not, for what, almost 30 years at this point? 1988, and it was actually an exhibit that opened long before a League of Their Own came out. One of the early attendees to the exhibit opening was Penny Marshall. Sure. She came to the, to the exhibit, yeah. said, this is an amazing story. And from the exhibit being opened in Cooperstown, she actually put together the team and wrote the film that we now know and love as a staple of American culture. So yeah. it was the museum documenting the story of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League for the first time really that anyone had done so mm -hmm. in such a way that was so inspiring to Penny to put the film wow. together. So it's, yeah. a, it's a true timeless representation of baseball's impact on American culture. Mm -hmm. And the Diamond Dreams exhibit that you see there was refreshed in 2006 to tell mm -hmm. the story not only of the women in the league, mm -hmm. but all the important roles that women yep. have played on and yep. off the diamond throughout history. Brad Horn, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. And coming up on the edge, speaking of baseball, what is the punishment for Jonathan Papelbon for the flare-up that happened over the weekend? That's coming up next on the edge.